It is my pleasure to introduce today's special guest, Congressman Ami Barra of California. Congressman Barra has represented the 7th District of California, which includes Sacramento County, California, since 2013. He's one of 17 physicians in Congress, having worked 20 years in primary care medicine and as the lead health official for Sacramento County prior to running for elected office. Congressman Barra serves as vice chair of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee and also chairs the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, and Nonproliferation. It's in this latter role that Congressman Barra held the first congressional hearing on the novel coronavirus in early February. In his time in Congress, Dr. Barra has been a strong supporter of science research and global health, and the American Society for Microbiology is grateful for this support and for his engagement with us since the pandemic began. Specifically, Congressman Barra has championed legislation to require a national testing plan for COVID-19 and to authorize U.S. participation in the International Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. Congressman Barra. Thank you for that generous introduction. You know, I, I think about COVID-19 as a physician and someone who's worked in the public health space, and it's been um, wonderful working with, with um, ASM on, on this endeavor as, you know, we're doing something remarkable here. If you think about everything that's happening in the science community in a relatively short period of time, you know, we've only been dealing with this novel coronavirus for you know, a little over five months and, you know, in, in fact, really ramping things up in, you know, the last two, two and a half months. And, you know, what we've been able to accomplish is remarkable, but we also understand that there is likely more that we don't know about this virus than we do. Um, and as we all work together, you know, it's been remarkable watching the scientific community come together to share information, to collaborate, both on, um, rapidly looking at uh, creating the best diagnostic tests, looking at the information that we're getting from serologic tests, but then also as we watch the, the vaccine development space come together, it, it really has been remarkable. It's also been interesting, you know, I tend to um, use terms like sensitivity, specificity, um, false positives, false negatives, um, positive predictive value and, you know, being able to use my medical knowledge as I work with many of my colleagues in, in Congress who don't come from that scientific background to watch them start to, to um, gain, gain that knowledge and understand what these terms are because they're hugely important as we, you know, rapidly ramped up to try to um, mitigate the spread of, of the virus early on. But now it's going to be incredibly important as we start to aggregate data, not just on the diagnostic side, but on the serologic side to get a sense of the, the accuracy uh, of the tests that are out there. Um, certainly there are concerns of you know, some of the, the false negative um, rates on the, the diagnostic tests that are there, and it'll be very important for us to understand what that false negative rates are of various diagnostic tests as we start to make policy decisions um, in terms of opening up, in terms of um, identifying cases and, and doing containment. Um, and on the serologic side, it'll be very important for us to understand as we're collecting that data and, you know, we're working with the CDC to, to start aggregating that data so we can get a sense of um, you know, prevalence in, in, in the United States. Um, but we're also going to need to understand that, you know, all serologic tests aren't the same. Understanding the, the difference between qualitative serologic tests and quantitative titer-based serologic tests as those become more available. So, you know, again, ev everything that's happening is happening in, in real time and very rapidly. Um, a few key principles that, you know, I know we, we've talked with ASM about and, and others is as much as we can do in a, a transparent way as we're sharing information across academic institutions and across you know, commercial labs, um, it's going to be incredibly important. And the more we can do sharing information globally, since we know this is not a virus that's impacting one community or one state or one country, but it's impacting the entire world at the same time. And the more we can take that global approach, sharing data and information um, across um, 
country borders will also help us get ahead of this virus. Um, you know, most of us know that we are likely in, you know, using a baseball analogy in the first innings of this game. And most of us expect that you know, come fall, come winter, we will see a, a resurgence of this virus, which may actually be worse than you know, this first phase was. So it also behooves us to start looking at best practices, learning um, what we've learned from these first few innings, and starting to prepare for how we address you know, the, the next phases of, uh, of this virus as it continues to spread, knowing that parts of the, the country are continuing to see rising cases and still um, dealing with that first phase. Um, this is where it's going to be really important for us as members of Congress to work with the academic community, to work with organizations like ASM, um, to help ASM inform our decision making. Um, so it's based in science and, 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 and fact and and not in politics. Um, and the best we can do to try to keep the politics out of this will certainly help us um, you know, address and get ahead of this, this um, pandemic. At, at the end of the day, though, we also know that we won't defeat this virus until we have a safe and effective vaccine. We have the ability to not just vaccinate 330 million Americans, but to um, vaccinate six to seven billion Americans uh, or six to seven billion people around the world, um, the logistics to, to, to manufacture the vaccine, the logistics to create the vials and the syringes and the global health workforce. So we have a monumental task ahead of us. I am optimistic that we can do this, um, but the pillars are gonna be making sure it's science-based, making sure we work together as a global community and we will defeat this virus. And I think we will come out on the back end with more resilience and, and you know, in a more compassionate, collaborative space um, on the global level. So I really do look forward to, to continuing to work with ASM and certainly um, with my colleagues in, in, in Congress. There's still a long road ahead of us, but what we've been able to accomplish in the last um, two and a half, three months is pretty remarkable. Um, but let's continue to be vigilant. Let's continue to work together and we will um, come out of this if we work together in a stronger place. So thank you to everyone who's on this call. You know, thank you to um, the association um, and you know the Society of Microbiologists. Really do appreciate all the work that, that all of you are doing and look forward to continuing to work with ASM. Be kind, be safe, and be well. Thank you, Congressman Farah. I will now introduce our experts for today. Dr. Esther Babidi is the Medical Director of the Clinical Microbiology Service, Department of Laboratory Medicine and Infectious Disease at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. A clinical microbiologist with expertise in molecular diagnosis of infectious diseases, Dr. Babidi oversees specimen testing in the laboratory and provides clinical consultation regarding the ordering of diagnostic tests and interpreting of their results. Her research interests include the development, validation, and clinical evaluation of molecular tests that offer faster and more sensitive diagnosis of infectious diseases with the goal of improving patient care. Dr. Babidi and her laboratory have also been on the front lines of the pandemic being located in New York City and also in an institution that serves a population with unique healthcare needs and compromised immunity. Dr. Elisa Thiel is the director of the Infectious Diseases Serology Laboratory and an associate professor of laboratory medicine and pathology at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Thiel's research interests include the development of new serologic assays and the evaluation of currently available serologic testing methods to aid in the diagnosis of bacterial, viral, fungal, and parasitic infectious diseases. She has been a leader in the effort to understand the antibody response to COVID-19 and how to measure this. The testing platforms and assays that Dr. Thiel develops and validates help guide patient diagnosis and therapeutic management of infectious diseases at the Mayo Clinic and for patients served through Mayo Clinic laboratories. I will now turn it over to Dr. Babidi. Thank you, Dr. Patel, for the introduction and thank you, ASM, for the opportunity to talk today about COVID-19 diagnostic. As Dr. Patel mentioned, I'm the Director of Microbiology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. 
And um, I'm really honored today to be able to share with you and discuss uh, COVID-19 diagnostics, particularly as it applied to molecular testing. So since I'm the first speaker, I figured that I will start at least with some COVID-19 um, reminder as far as the biology of the infection. So as we all know now, coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus disease 2019, is caused by the SARS-CoV-2, which stands for um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. As many of us know now, this is a highly contagious virus that is transmitted human to human to spread by respiratory droplets. The incubation period, meaning the time between exposure of the, to the virus and the development and symptom, ranges from 2 to 14 days, with a median of approximately 5 days. One of the things that's been quite challenging with COVID-19 is the fact that the disease spectrum ranges from asymptomatic carriage, meaning patient has, uh, has the infection but no symptom, um, to severe disease that can cause significant morbidity and unfortunately mortality as well. To put this a little bit more into perspective, we can look at the U.S. COVID-19 cases in the United States. So this is data from the CDC COVID data tracker. As of May 26, we have approximately 1.6 million cases with nearly 100,000 deaths. And as you can see on this map, every single state in the union, including the District of Columbia, has had cases of COVID-19. So this is something that affects all of us. So how does one become um, diagnosed with COVID-19? So of course, it starts with a clinical assessment. You have symptoms, you present to your, um, to your primary care physician, and they will take a history and look for symptoms that are, are supportive of COVID-19. And these will include, but of course are not limited to cough, shortness of breath, fever, chills, headache, sore throat, muscle pain, loss of taste or smell, which is kind of a unique a symptom for COVID-19. However, a recent um, guideline from the Infectious Disease Society of America that were generated in collaboration and with input from the American Society for Microbiology remarks that clinical assessment alone is actually not accurate in predicting COVID-19 diagnosis. Therefore, testing is necessary to ensure that the symptoms that a patient exhibits can accurately be attributed to COVID-19. So COVID-19 progression and viral marker. So this slide came out a little bit funky, but let's see if it works. Right. So COVID-19, um, the infection essentially starts, of course, with exposure to the virus. And the, from the time the exposure occurred to the time that viral marker occurred, there is a little bit of delay so depending on that, the testing has to be targeted and well controlled. All right? So this is a little bit old funky. However, we're going to move this forward, so then we can be at the end of that. So following exposure, it takes a little bit of time. So we talked already about the incubation period. So the incubation period varying from 2 to 14 days, there's a little bit of delay between the time a patient is exposed to the time that they become infectious but also to the time that they actually exhibit viral marker that can be detected by the laboratory. So this window period before um, any viral marker is detectable is really important when you think about the false negative rate that the, the, the congressman was referring to a little bit earlier. However, a few days um, prior to the patient becoming symptomatic and a few days after that, the viral RNA, which is the genomic material from the virus, starts to appear and increase exponentially. So early during the infection, patient can be diagnosed by detection of this viral RNA. And as you can see on this graph, uh, sort of see on this graph, um, the RNA rises significantly, but eventually will fall down and um, can remain detectable for up to six weeks. After the RNA is detected um, and the infection resolved, uh, usually patients start developing antibody, which is the host immune response to exposure to COVID-19. 
and my colleague, Dr. Taylor, will be discussing this in more detail in the next um, talk. So what I want to focus now on is molecular testing. So as I mentioned, early after the infection, um, the viral RNA becomes detectable. And so the purpose of molecular tests is to detect that particular viral RNA. However, the RNA, the molecular test doesn't necessarily detect the entire genome or even the virus itself, but is really, is really designed to detect just a fragment of the, the, um, the COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 um, genomic RNA. Molecular tests are exquisitely sensitive. So they can detect really small pieces. And because of that, they are really used to diagnose um, the acute infection really early on at the beginning of, of uh, the disease process. Often, this diagnosis is done by um, detecting viral RNA fragments in a clinical sample, particularly a nasopharyngeal swab, which is what I'm showing in this image here. So a nasopharyngeal swab is a thin swab with a brush at the tip that is inserted through your nasal cavity to collect fluids and cells that may be um, positive for the virus. And then this is sent to the laboratory for testing. But the sensitivity of um, this molecular test sometimes is a double sword edge. What do I mean by that is that because they are meant to detect just the RNA, not, not necessarily the virus, um, they do not have the, ab the ability to detect or differentiate between um, a viable and non-viable virus. And so if you remember from the previous slide, um, at the beginning of the infection, you had really high viral load, so a lot of RNA to detect. But sometimes this RNA will remain, remain around for um, approximately six weeks, which sometimes can cause some challenges in trying to interpret um, molecular testing. So when a patient presents to um, the hospital or a collection center, um, a COVID-19 test is ordered and a swab is collecting. So if we think about from start to finish, how does a molecular test work? Once that swab is collected, it's placed into a viral transport media or any other acceptable fluid and sent to the laboratory. In the laboratory, the RNA is isolated from the virus um, and to do that, we use specific reagent and instrument that will break open the virus and release the RNA that can then be amplified using a molecular test, more specifically um, processes that are called nucleic acid amplification assay. Many of us know it as simply PCR. And again, similar to the RNA isolation, the amplification of RNA is done using reagent and instrumentation that is specific for that purpose. Once it's amplified from a few copies that may be present in the sample to uh, multiple um, copies of RNA that can then be detected in the lab, the last step is the detection of this RNA. And this is done using fluorescent marker um, most commonly. So from beginning to end, um, the RNA isolation, the amplification, and the detection can occur either in the same instrumentation, and then we know that we have some rapid tests that are miniaturized to do this at a point of care, but can also occur in different instrumentation. But from beginning to end, depending on the platform that one uses, it takes anywhere from five to 10 minutes to several hours to um, let a patient know if they have COVID-19 or not. So this is how a molecular test works. What does it actually take to develop this assay? So developing molecular tests is quite a complex process. Um, and um, essentially, you start with having the molecular diagnostic expertise in the laboratory. So ideally, this would be a laboratory director, like many members of ASM, or someone else in the lab that has knowledge of diagnostic meaning. They understand how to design the assay, and they understand how to put them in place in the laboratory. Ideally, the diagnostic occur, the more development occur in a high complexity clinical laboratory, which is set up really to ensure that um, testing is done under the highest regulatory um, and quality control 
and um, using staff that has qualification necessary for performing that test. Not a small thing, the fact that um, developing molecular tests require a significant financial um, investment. And again, I can't emphasize this enough, experienced staff that is able to um, perform the testing. Finally, um, reagent and, sam and sample, especially samples that are positive for the virus that we're trying to detect. And this was definitely a big challenge in um, laboratory trying to develop COVID-19, access to reagent and access to known positive sample. At the end of the, um, uh, once we have all of these pieces together, then we can optimize the test, meaning that we can make sure that the tests work for different collection um, um, type, for different specimen type, and implement them in the hospital in a way that makes it really simple for the clinician reading the report to understand um, the results generated by the laboratory. So not a small, a small endeavor, a rather complex process. So you've heard me talk a little bit about sensitivity and saying that the assays are exquisitely sensitive. So when we develop molecular tests, there are two key performance markers that we really like to focus on, and those include the analytical sensitivity and the analytical specificity. The analytical sensitivity essentially refers to the ability of the test to detect the virus. And the lower the amount of uh, virus a test can detect, the higher the sensitivity. So it's very important performance characteristic. Analytical specificity, on the other hand, refers to the ability of the, of the test to only detect the virus, meaning if a patient has, let's say, influenza, the test is not going to call it COVID-19. As of last week, there was approximately 63 vendor and 28 laboratory that had approved tests on the FDA COVID-19. They had approval from the FDA under emergency use authorization. And as you can see on the slide, while they, most of them are quite specific, 99 to 100% um, specific, the analytical sensitivity vary greatly, almost a thousand-fold difference, meaning that some of the assays on the market right now may have a, um, can detect as little as 100 copies of the COVID-19 um, RNA, while some may require 100,000 copies. So there's quite a difference in the sensitivity of many of these tests that are currently available. So because of this, um, again, the Infectious Disease Society of America in, in collaboration with ASM and the different members of, of both societies tend to work together to come up with guidelines and approaches on what to do uh, when a test is initially negative. And that would depend again on the clinical suspicion. So, if a patient presents and has symptoms that are suggestive of COVID-19, but a molecular test is done and is negative, if the suspicion is intermediate or high, the recommendation is then to repeat testing 24 to 48 hours later. And this is so we can get out of that window period I was mentioning earlier where no viral marker is detectable. So giving time to the virus to replicate inside of the host and become detectable. However, if the test is negative and the suspicion for COVID-19 was low, there is like no need to retest and then the patient can just be uh, feel comfortable that they are negative for COVID-19. So to summarize, I will stop here and to summarize what I discussed today, molecular testing for COVID-19 are used primarily to diagnose acute infection to the detection of viral RNA. Developing this test requires significant expertise and a significant human and financial investment to make sure that the assays developed perform accurately. Uh, finally, the interpretation will, may, will require clinical and laboratory guidance for optimal results interpretation, since members of ASM as well as um, Great. Uh, and Thank many you. of the other laboratory directors have a great understanding uh, so of I will transition. test about serologic or antibody um, tests for SARS-CoV-2. Again, these are tests that we use to detect our immune response to the virus rather than detecting the virus itself. 
So just to set the stage here, our immune response to any infection is very complex, involving a synchronized interplay of different immune cells and molecules that make up our immune system. And zeroing in on antibodies, you can see that they're just one part or one component of this dynamic um, response. So antibodies themselves are small proteins that are found in blood. They're able to recognize and bind to an infectious agent at specific regions on its surface called antigens, which you can see in the image here. There are five different types or classes of antibodies. However, for, for the most part, all of the serologic or antibody tests that have been developed for COVID-19 detect either IgM, IgG, uh, class antibodies or total uh, antibodies. And very briefly, IgM class antibodies are typically the first to form after an infection and then they become undetectable about two to three months later, whereas IgG class antibodies form soon after IgM and these are the long-lasting antibodies that are present for months to potentially years and decades after infection. So because SARS-CoV-2 is a new virus, which no one has really been exposed to in the past, after infection, it does take time for these virus-specific antibodies to develop. And that's uh, what's shown here in the graph to the, to the right, similar to what Dr. Babidi just showed earlier. Um, again, though, you can see that after symptom onset, it takes a good one to two weeks. Uh, for antibodies to develop, and this delay is why we want to rely on molecular or PCR tests, not antibody tests, to diagnose acute infection early on. So we're still learning about our immune response to the virus, but we know that most individuals will be antibody positive after about two weeks of symptoms, and while IgM antibodies seem to decline after about five to seven weeks, we know that IgG antibodies will remain detectable for much longer. So given this understanding of the timing of our immune response, the question is, what role do serologic tests for this virus really play in the current environment? And so there's a general consensus amongst multiple organizations that serologic testing is useful for the purposes of epidemiologic or prevalence studies. Um, additionally, these antibody tests are necessary for identification of potential convalescent plasma donors and they'll be essential to evaluate the efficacy of candidate vaccines as they enter clinical trials. And then these tests can be used as potential aids for the diagnosis of recent COVID-19 in patients who are negative by molecular tests and, again, who present later on in their disease course. Then there's also scenarios for when antibody testing is not recommended, including, again, as mentioned, for diagnosis of acute infection, they should also not be used to determine whether or not a patient has developed protective immunity against reinfection. And because of that particular unknown, antibody results really can't yet be used to guide um, and, and make decisions on whether personal protective equipment should be used or whether or not an individual should adhere to social distancing practices or recommendations. So with that background, I'll move on to what testing is currently available um, for antibody testing, and that includes about 190 commercial serologic tests, a list of which you can kind of see below. Um, Twelve of these tests have received emergency use authorization from the FDA, and last week the FDA announced that 29 serologic tests or manufacturers either did not submit for or did not receive emergency use authorization and so they recommend that those tests no longer be used or distributed. So the serologic tests really differ in their design, including in their format, and for the most part, uh, the, they can be separated as either lateral flow assays, uh, which are pretty rapid, or they are more complicated enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays or chemiluminescent-based assays. And very briefly, these lateral flow assays are essentially like a pregnancy test. They're quick to perform in 10 to 15 minutes off of a blood sample. And if authorized as such, these are the tests that can be used at the point of care. On the other hand, ELISA's and chemiluminescent assays take longer to perform. However, more patients can be tested at once. And these tests are automated on instruments rather than being done one by one by hand, like the lateral flow tests. 
And so because of that, these tests are really preferred by most hospital labs as well as uh, reference labs throughout the U.S. The serologic tests also differ in what type of antibody is detected as listed here, and they also differ in what SARS-CoV-2 viral protein is used in the test kit, um, which I've listed the three most common ones here. But my point with this slide is really to show that there's quite a bit of variety between the serologic tests that are available, and because of these differences, at least to an extent, uh, you can imagine that not all of them will perform identically. So this is just a list of the 12 serologic tests with current emergency use authorization. Again, to show you that they too vary in the sample type that's ex uh, accepted, and they also differ in their overall um, design. So the obvious question that comes up is how well do these antibody tests actually perform? And while manufacturer performance data is important, as Dr. Babidi uh, nicely explained, Clinical laboratories routinely perform their own evaluations and, and thorough verifications of tests uh, before offering them for clinical use. So we look at a number of different performance characteristics, including uh, test sensitivity and specificity, which I thought I'd, again, quickly define for this group. Um, so sensitivity or clinical sensitivity is looking to answer the question of among people with the disease or with the infection, how many of them will test positive by, uh, by this test? On the other hand, specificity is looking to answer the question of among people without the infection, how many of them will test negative by this test? So if we look at sensitivity and specificity uh, for the assays with emergency use authorization, and this data is found on the FDA um, website, you can see that with the exception of a couple of the lateral flow tests, sensitivity is pretty high, um, above 90 or 95 percent for the majority of these uh, methods. And then specificity is um, also fairly high for most of these tests, approaching 100 percent for a number of assays, which is really saying quite something for, um, for a serologic-based method. In addition to sensitivity and specificity, though, we also look at the positive predictive value of, of these tests, and that determines what the probability is that an individual um, that tests positive by this test truly has antibodies to the virus. And that probability is impacted by both the specificity of the test, but also importantly by the prevalence of the disease in the population. And in general, the lower the prevalence of the disease, the lower the positive predictive value of that test, meaning that there's a higher risk of a positive result occurring in an individual who has not been infected. So I'm not going to go into the calculation details, but I wanted to share with you an example of how that works here. So we're using the exact same test with excellent sensitivity and specificity but we find that if we test 1,000 individuals from a region with a 1% prevalence of COVID-19, the positive predictive value of this test is only about 47%, meaning that the probability that an individual who tests positive truly has antibodies to COVID-19 is only about 50%. And compare that to using the same test in a region where COVID-19 prevalence is 5%, and you can see that that positive predictive value jumps to 83%. So you can see why it's really important to use these tests widely and to also try to use the most specific tests uh, possible. So going back to our performance characteristics table, again from the FDA website, you can see that the positive predictive value for many of these tests in regions where uh, prevalence is 5% or higher is actually quite good, ranging from about 90 to close to 100%, uh, uh, again, with the exception of a number of tests. So when it comes to serologic test interpretation, generally a negative antibody result indicates no prior infection or exposure to the virus, with the caveat that results will be negative if samples are collected too soon following infection or if the patient has a um, dysfunctional immune system. A positive result, on the other hand, suggests that a patient was infected at some point in the recent or distant past, but as we talked about, the accuracy of that result will really be impacted by the local prevalence of the infection and the overall specificity of the test itself. 
And then what we need to keep in mind, though, is what these results do not uh, yet tell us. And that is whether or not a patient with a positive antibody result is actually protected against reinfection. So because of this unknown, we can't yet use a positive antibody result to guide decisions regarding adherence to social distancing recommendations or use of personal protective equipment. So what do we know about protective in immunity against uh, SARS-CoV-2? As I alluded to earlier on our uh, on the first slide, our immune response is really multifaceted and not solely dependent on antibodies. Um, that being said, IgG class antibodies do play a big role in protective immunity, and it's uh, specifically IgG neutralizing antibodies that are key. These neutralizing antibodies inhibit the virus from infecting other cells. But unfortunately, not all antibodies are neutralizing, and the commercially available tests that we have right now do not distinguish neutralizing from non-neutralizing antibodies. Testing for neutralizing antibodies is or can be pretty challenging for reasons that I won't get into. Um, so for that reason, though, they're not widely available yet in the U.S. That being said, we know from initial studies that most individuals will develop neutralizing antibodies after infection, and we know that reinfection with uh, COVID-19 does not really seem to occur in preliminary studies in rhesus macaque monkeys, which alongside other anecdotal findings does seem to suggest that we likely will generate at least some immunity to reinfection for at least a short period of time. But the question remains, what level of neutralizing antibodies are protective and how long does that protection last? So in summary, I think it's a great stride forward that we have increased oversight for the available serologic tests that are currently on the market. Um, the role of antibody testing, I think, will evolve over time as we gain a better understanding of our immune response to this virus. I shared with you some of the performance characteristics for serologic assays with emergency use uh, authorization. And again, I think that we just need to be very strategic and smart about how we use these assays, especially in low prevalence uh, settings. And then we also talked about the importance of neutralizing antibodies, which are able to independently inactivate the virus, leading to um, potentially immunity, but they're not the only component of our immune response that's important. And then finally, I think the big unknown right now is what level and duration of protective immunity against reinfection is provided following a primary infection. I think we need to support the research in this particular area because once we have a better sense of that answer, I think antibody testing will have a much bigger role to play in our efforts to control this pandemic. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Patel. Thank you so much, Dr. Thiel and Dr. Babity, for your outstanding presentation. Yes, hi, this is Alan Siegel from ASM. Uh, and again, thank you, Dr. Patel, and thank you, Dr. Thiel and Dr. Babity. We do have time for a few questions. Um, I see Dr. Patel has turned her camera back on, and uh, Dr. Babity and Dr. Thiel, if you'd like to share your uh, camera as well uh, for the Q&A. Um, uh, one question that we got, um, and I think this is probably best for you, Dr. Thiel, is uh, we know that many viruses, such as the common cold, uh, are also classified as coronaviruses. Uh, and can you comment on whether sero serological tests being developed for COVID-19 cross-react with the antibodies against other coronaviruses? So, for example, how would we know that somebody has SARS-CoV-2 and not just a regular cold? Yeah, so that's a, a great question, a common question. We know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus does share about 25 to 35 percent similarity at the protein level with other common coronaviruses, and there have been a few papers that have documented some cross-reactivity or false positive results with some of the COVID-19 antibody tests in samples from patients with antibodies to the other common coronaviruses. However, um, I think we have to keep in mind that considering that over 70 or 80 percent of us have antibodies to at least one of these common coronaviruses, and as we talked about, the reported false positivity rate for these antibody tests is less than 2 percent, I would say that even though false positive results um, on these COVID antibody tests may occur, 
uh, it would seem that this is fairly infrequent, uh, or at least not common at this point. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Babidi, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your uh, explanation of the uh, the process of developing tests. Uh, uh, and we've got a question along those lines about uh, viral mutations uh, and whether mutations affect the accuracy of tests. Uh, and will new tests be needed to develop Need, will new tests need to be developed uh, as virus virus mutates? So that's an excellent question. And um, as I was mentioning earlier in my talk, coronavirus is an RNA virus. And traditionally, these viruses have been um, highly subject to having mutation. However, when we develop tests, we try to design the assay so that they target a very stable region of the virus that is less likely to develop mutation. And this will then help your test remain sensitive um, and not be as um, uh, subject to mutation um, that occurs that would occur in other regions of the genome. But part of developing an assay is really keeping track of all of the new genomes that are produced, right? So as more people are positive for COVID-19, their entire the genome of the virus can actually be completely sequenced and is available uh, on the public domain. And as you develop your assay, you try to use all of the information that's currently available to make sure that the assay is designed in a way that's not going to result in a false negative result. And so this is called the inclusivity. You have to make sure that your assay is inclusive of all of the available viral sequence out there. I'm sure that as time goes and the virus starts developing more mutation, one of the responsibility, which goes back again to having that molecular diagnostic expertise, one of the responsibility from the laboratory director will be to ensure that the assay continues to perform as expected. And same thing with the vendors, they have to make sure that the assays, and so they will check that um, periodically to make sure that um, whenever we have mutation, it doesn't affect the assay. And if it does, then we have to make changes to how the assays were designed to ensure that we keep generating um, accurate data. So that was a great question. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, here's one I, uh, I'll, I'll ask Dr. Patel to comment on, although uh, 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 any of you should feel free to weigh in. Um, the American Society for Microbiology has been working to address regulatory issues and ba barriers facing laboratories, including shortages of testing supplies and uh, gauging testing, testing capacity. Uh, can you talk about your experiences in getting test, uh, testing supplies, uh, and to what extent ha have there been challenges, and how have you navigated them? Um, Thank you, Alan. Um, Sorry, to I've been really I uh, just wanted to note that it was requested that if the presenters could please speak up. Thank you so much. Sorry, continue. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Alan, thank you for your Alan, thank you for your uh, I, uh, We've always dealt with supply chain with issues supply chain in laboratories, in laboratories, but not as frequently as we've dealt with them during this pandemic. It, the need for testing is huge, and uh, Dr. Babidi emphasize the expertise that's needed to carry out the testing. But on top of that, uh, just the sheer volume of instrumentation and what we call reagents, which is a term that I now understand most people don't recognize, um, all, the, all the things you need to do to do a test um, have become strained uh, throughout this epidemic. Uh, and uh, so we've, we really needed help. We've needed help to understand where the gaps are, where the supply chain issues really are, and how to get the needed supplies to laboratories so that testing can be done. Testing is complex. It's, it's not just uh, sort of a kit that you, you buy and everything comes in the box uh, and, and you can get it done. Um, there are multiple components uh, to testing. And, uh, and many of them have become strained. From the swabs, for example, they're used to collect the specimens, uh, to what we call viral transport medium, which I'm sure we never thought we'd be talking about in the sort of public domain. 
uh, to all the reagents we need to extract out that RNA that uh, Dr. Babidi talked about to the amplification reagents. Everything has been um, compromised in terms of supply chain issues. And ASM has been instrumental in uh, working with the companies and also with the government to try to relieve some of those supply chain issues. I will say they are ongoing. We're not finished. Um, but uh, certainly, uh, we really appreciate the government's help in terms of uh, helping make available what we need to do the testing. Uh, we've also been working with regulatory agencies to make sure that uh, we can get tests out there, but also that the tests that are out there are safe and effective for their use. Um, that's a tricky balance, obviously, uh, but uh, something that uh, we've been advocating for and, and fortunately uh, have had a very good relationship with the FDA uh, throughout this whole pandemic uh, to, to try to uh, navigate an appropriate, appropriate path to make testing available but safe at the same time. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. Um, uh, one of the things that you discussed, Dr. Theo, was the, the role of antibody testing uh, to as assess prevalence, uh, which can help inform and guide our public health response and understanding for how the virus is spreading in the community. So uh, how, uh, how do your labs uh, work with uh, public health officials who are trying to track and trace what is happening with the virus. Um, yeah, so like, like you said, one of the primary roles of antibody testing right now is looking for prevalence. So we have worked closely with our um, uh, public health lab here in Minnesota to you know, make sure that we're reporting the right uh, results in a timely fashion. We also, as a reference laboratory practice, you know, we send out those results to all public health labs um, and then take back feedback from them, um, you know, to make sure that we're reporting what they want in, in, in a way that is um, understandable and, and usable for them. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank our, uh, our panelists today uh, and our host, uh, Dr. Patel. Uh, this has been a wonderfully informative session. Thanks, everyone. <music>